You're live, by the way, Tom. It's recording, so nothing confidential or me. <laughs> Alright, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yes, I do. But, hey, Tommy, we need a ball ball. We need a ball ball. Just do it in a different way. So now maybe
Get see if we get a little power in this. <laughs>
Uh, Doris Christie, not doing well. Uh, Sandra Parrish is a friend of Linda Kratz. She had well in surgery and just started chemo. Cliff Kimball under doctor's care for a leg injury. Also another book in prayer. And Brother Moyne scheduled for MRI tomorrow, so we ask that the results are favorable for that. So uh, let's keep all those in our prayer. Our prayer this morning is the solid on the solid rock. And uh, after our prayer again, Brother Moyne will lead us in prayer. Yeah, 
Father in heaven, amazing grace, that's what we just said. Let's save the rest of our people. Let's bring those walls to the deep end. Let's get out of the house. Thank you, Father, for the gift of coming back to you and so on. God, would you call us? We want to give us a lot. Thank you, Father, for the victory of death and death.
pray. Heavenly Father, what a pleasure it is to be in your house this day. As we look over what has happened this past week, let us realize there is so many blessings you bestow upon us. All we have to do is just look. Don't let us take that for granted, please. As we give back a portion that belongs to you, let us do it in a joyful way that it will proclaim you here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This next praise him, I'm going to meet the kids up here. And Dean. Yeah, I'll be there. Okay. Over here is Watch Room. Oh, yeah. Time to get up. All right, let's stand up for this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
another sad and drastic situation, tragic. Great celebration, the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back to Jerusalem. In our terminology of today's culture, you would say all of Israel was partying. I mean, they were excited the Ark of God was being returned and a big to do. And had it on probably one of the finest looking carts of the day, drawn probably by some of the finest looking cows. And then the cart hit something, apparently, the ark teetered and tottered. The Bible says in verse number 9, first, print, uh, first Chronicles 13. When they came to the threshing floor of Chiron, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark and he died there before the Lord. And just upon reading, he said, Why? Why would God do that to Uzzah? And David had the same reaction. King David was angry with God. He was afraid to go before God. He finally did. He finally did some study of the scriptures. In chapter 15, verse 11, King David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Messiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Elio, and Aminadab. He said to them, You are the head, heads of the father's household of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves. Both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place that I prepared for it. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us. For we did not seek him according to the ordinance. Specifics. You do a little study on that, you find that the ark of the covenant had rings on it, four particular rings, two on one end, two on the other, and through those rings there were to be poles inserted, and then those of the tribe of Levi, four individuals I believe, were one on each corner of the ark were to put those poles on their shoulders and they were to in reverence before God carry the ark of God. Somewhere along the line Israel lost sight of the importance of paying attention to the specifics and being precise with God's commands. And it had deviated all the way to the point where they just plopped it on some cart drawn by oxen. What a sham. No wonder God broke out. It was the proverbial straw that broke God's back. Now, We've seen movies maybe where there's an archman and they're aiming at a target and they hit the bullseye and everything's to look to their competitor and say, beat that if you can. The second guy will step up, draw the arrow and split the arrow that's already there. And we ooh and we awe and we say, man, that is amazing. Wow, what's happening? But yet, when it comes to leaders and teachers and preachers calling God's people to pay attention and to be precise with God's commands and carry it out exactly as God has said to do, we're not doing it at all. Instead, we kind of criticize them and we deride and we say, oh, I think you're being a little strict, don't you think? I don't think we're being too strict. Honestly, does it really matter what you or I think? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. There is a statement that quotes the Old Testament passage from the book of Exodus. And it is, it is in regard to Moses that took place before this incident with the Ark of the Covenant. When Moses was Constructing and being given the instructions for the tabernacle that was to accompany Israel throughout their journey. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, God gave Moses a clear warning. It wasn't just advice, it just wasn't a command, but God warned it, Moses. He said, that, See that you make everything according to. To the pattern. Can you say that? Make everything according to the pattern. It's dangerous to deviate from the pattern. 
It's dangerous to go to the right or the left. The Bible says straight is the way. Straight is the way that leads to life. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. Few find it. Now, I think the reason few find it is because so few really are willing to submit to the authority of God and say, God, show me exactly what I'm to do here. And as we talked last week, through prayer, we pray for his will. And through study, we find out what his will is. And in the fellowship, as we come together, we are held accountable to each other. And then in the mission, we go out and look for individuals who are willing to submit to the authority of God and the authority of Jesus Christ and to walk with the leading of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know people have a problem with authority in our society today? Little Johnny had a problem with authority. He was standing there. So finally, the teacher told him to sit down. No, folks, I'm not even taking some of your kids or grandkids. <laughs> the teacher said, Johnny, have a seat. Johnny refused. Johnny, I said, have a seat. Johnny refused. Finally, the teacher came up to Johnny and physically placed him in the chair and said, sit down. Johnny looked up at her and said, I may be sitting on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still standing. You <laughs> <laughs> a problem with authority. Just being in the position that I am, I run into that all the time. It just comes with the territory as a preacher. Present the truths of the gospel. I am not permitted to deviate from it. I'm not permitted to make my own provisions. By the way, Moses was not allowed to improvise. Why would he want to? The pattern was perfect. The pattern was preparing us for heaven. It was for our benefit to go according to the code. And even you and I as Christians, when I'm not in the role of a being perceived as, that's the preacher, oh no, here he comes, he's going to give us a word from God, and we're going to have to submit to that authority, and we present it. But even as Christians, don't you understand that as you go out, and you live as light in a world of darkness, people recognize the authority that they feel is being imposed upon them, where they're good if they receive it right, yet they will malign us, now we're in, we're in the target. We're in the target of the enemy. And Christians have been persecuted since the church began. Persecution is still rampant on the globe. There used to be a day in America. I just read this the other night. These guys said, you know, when I was a kid, we were at least able to say, at least in America, we're free to worship. You know, you don't have to worry about persecution and all that. I'm not sure that's a good thing, by the way, to not worry about persecution. I believe that when the church was persecuted in the Bible, that's when they were the strongest because that's when they depended most on God. Am I making sense? Just this last weekend, world more Oklahoma. If you're paying attention to anything that's going on, right? Man, who's a Muslim? Now, was it based on that? You decide. Talking about his Facebook page. Now everything's for jihad, devout Muslim, believes in Christians, and America ought to just go to hell, basically. He's upset, apparently, because he was fired, so he stabbed a woman and beheaded another. Now we see it on the news internationally, so now it's come home. It's gone. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think we have a whole course. I think we got to continue to stay precise in God's word. In fact, I think we got to pray more. We'll pray more persistently. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Ask for God's spirit to lead. Pray for boldness. Pray that we be true Christians. And that we will be keenly desirous of knowing what are the specifics. So that we come to stand before God, we're not having any reason to get ready. Are you looking forward to dying? Some people are.
Some people are just ready to quit, give up, go on, but I don't want to face anymore. I want to fight as long as I can in this earthly life. Get a battle of life. By the way, I do it to save myself, to save my wife, to save my kids, and my grandkids, and if I live long enough, my grandkids. <laughs> Let me give them an example that it is possible to be specific and be precise and honor God. You may be thinking this morning, well, are there any scriptures that, that back up what you're saying? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. How about Matthew chapter 7? How about Matthew chapter 7? The Bible says there are going to be many on the day of judgment who are going to cry out, Lord, Lord, when did you see? And, and, and they're going to think that they were saved. We did many works in your name. And the Lord's going to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. This is where Jesus says in Matthew 7 13, enter through the narrow gate. The gate is wide, the broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Why is that? I believe it's because so few really want to know the truth. I mean, basically, when we go to a doctor and he tells us something we don't like, what do we say? I would like a. And so we go to God's word, thank God, show me what you want me to do. And we'll be praying about it. It's, and it's great to pray about it, but if you go to God's word, you'll find out what his will is. And you'll notice when, when you read, it's like, I can't believe I asked that in prayer because what I just asked is definitely not his will. And we'll say, oh God, show me what you want, it, want me to do. And he shows us through his word. And we say, I would like to have a second opinion. Mm -hmm. Ignoring the specifics is deadly in the spiritual realm. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Paul said, if we or an angel preach a different gospel than what we have preached, if anyone, even if an angel from heaven were to preach a different gospel than what we have preached unto you, let it be eternally condemned. It's dangerous for me to get up here and speak to you this morning. It's dangerous for me to speak any Sunday to any audience. It's dangerous for me to take any role in a teaching position to anybody regarding Christ. Here's why. If I error, and if I preach a different gospel than I should, then what was delivered through Christ? I endanger my eternal salvation. I'm going to help you. That's why it's dangerous. But it's equally dangerous not to speak at all. And so it does. We say we are Christians, right? We say we're concerned about folks being lost. And we want them to go to heaven. But yet, how many don't say a word to any? They don't speak at all. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'd rather keep praying and keep studying and keep speaking, but the chance of making an error here and there, because I will, with a multitude of words, so that eventually get an error. But I'd rather at least keep preaching and teaching and save as many as possible than to not speak at all and save no one. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 3, if you're taking notes on this, I hope you check this. I'll take my word for it. Take the Bible's word. Apostle Paul said, if anyone teaches a different doctrine than the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he knows nothing. He knows nothing. Again, as I said in Matthew 7, he said, Depart from me, I never knew you. Those who are crying out, Lord, Lord, you really thought. Basically, they came before the judgment seat of Christ, saying what the commander of the space shuttle said just prior to the explosion. Uh -oh. I wonder how many people will come and stand in the presence of God, thinking they were saved, then realizing they're not. Uh oh. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. If you're blind and you're trying to lead someone that's blind, what will happen to you? You will both fall into the pit. I still remember, I told you this before, I still remember the parent lawnmower agent down in Mississippi. And this lady in this big, I just called it a green bomb. I don't know what it was, a big gas hole back in the east. We just fixed the lawnmower. I think it was one of those. Uh, 
Well, I got in trouble for this from the day that I thought, oh, I got fired over this thing. They brought this one board, these two other ladies. We can't get it to start. I don't know about you, but the first thing I do is check the gas. It was empty. Put a little gas in there, boom, fire it right up. Not much we owe you. Wow. I didn't have authority to do that, but I tell you, Mr. Bush said he was furious. We were supposed to get paid $45 an hour. I didn't get paid $45 an hour. I was going to wait four bucks an hour. You know? He was getting $45 an hour. My dollars. But anyway, right before they drove off, bless your heart, you're there. And says, Young man, you got I'm thinking, I come up. He says, Can you tell me whether or not I have it in drive? <laughs> When you are aware that you're in the presence of someone trying to lead you, they can't see beyond the end of their nose, they're spiritually blind, get as far away from them as you can, lest you fall the pit with them. And if they're open to instruction, gently, as gently as possible, or as strong as possible, depending on what the situation calls, try to deliver them. So they don't go to hell. In prayer, be consistent. Someone was asking me the other day, is there, is there, is there the Bible says a certain way to pray? There's a lot of different ways you pray, but be persistent. Some argue about you should be on your knees, should you stand, should you have your eyes closed, your eyes open. To me, getting to where I am, 56, maybe I still think I'm pretty young. I close my eyes and pray out that I stay awake. So when I pray, I keep my eyes open. I just look down the floor. It helps me to concentrate better. These guys are arguing, I think I'll be on your knees. I think I'll have a fly to your face. One guy said, Man, I fell in a well, it's hanging upside down. So pray this prayer out and pray this hanging on my head in that well. <laughs> Point is, pray. I love Bible study. Any specifics on that? We'll talk about Bible study. I was running this through my mind earlier this week. In case you've never heard of this, when you're studying the Bible, there are some questions you have to ask whenever you're reading any passage of Scripture so that you can pay attention to the specifics and be as precise as possible and truly be saved. One reason is I always ask when you're reading the Scripture, who is speaking? Who is speaking? You say that? Who is speaking? Have you ever read the book of Job? Job speaks at one point. Wife speaks at one point. And if you just take Job's wife's advice, just read that curse God and die. See, the Bible tells us the curse God and die. Who is speaking? Job's wife. And then there's those other, other three dudes, his supposed friends. And they're just a bunch of hot air. I can't believe you said that. About them. God the one that said they were full of hot air. Read the book of Job. If you're not careful when you read through the book of Job, you may accidentally take one of those hot air guys said as gospel truth. That's who is speaking. Second thing is, always to whom are they speaking? Are they speaking to the Christian or are they talking talk to someone who talks? Take a look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Here's, here's, here's a case in point where many people miss the specific and they veer off the course and never come to Christ in the way that God made. 1 John chapter 1, 9, what's it say? We confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Who is speaking? It's an easy one. It's in the book of 1 John. But who is speaking? John. This is an apostle, so you can take this one to the bank. <laughs> to whom is he speaking? Now, there are no names mentioned. <laughs> Is he speaking to those who are lost outside of Christ, or is he speaking to those who are Christians, those who are in Christ? <laughs> Christians. That is vital. Because how many times you have people who just simply trust the television to be their answer in everything in regards to the Bible? And they'll, they'll trust whatever those preachers are saying on television. And almost at the end of every one of them, that preacher will say, Now you just need to ask Jesus into your heart. Because the Bible says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just us of our sins. So they teach people, just confess it, just tell God, just ask them in your heart. Who's he talking to in first John? He's talking to those who are already Christians. You want to know what to do if you're 
wants to go to someone who was talking to those who were not Christians. Anybody have how to get to that like this? How about Peter in Acts chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, Peter is speaking to thousands who are not Christians. They heard the gospel. They evidently believed the gospel when they interrupted Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and said, what shall we do? And then Peter told those non-Christians what they must do. First, repent. Complete turnaround, turn to God, and then be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ so their sins may be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Last one, not only ask who is speaking, to whom are they speaking. Third one, what is the time period when it was spoken? See, the Old Testament and New Testament, right? Can you think of any other time in history besides that? At least human history. <laughs> can't. It's either Old Testament or it's New Testament. Thief on the cross. Jesus says to him, whoop, give it away. Here's the words. Today you will be with me in paradise. Who is speaking? Jesus. He gave you the answer to crying out loud. <laughs> this ain't fun here. See, I see. So Jesus is speaking. To whom is he speaking? The thief on the cross. Both of them are one of them. Um, that's important to remember too. Some folks say, well, I wasn't afraid the other one. The other one didn't repent. The other one didn't say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All right. Now, when were those words spoken? Were they written? Were those words of Christ spoken under the Old Testament law? Or were those words spoken under the New Testament law, which we're now part of? Old Testament. Old Testament. <laughs> The thief on the cross lived and died under the Old Testament before Jesus died and buried and rose again. Where do you live? We're over here. When did Jesus command baptism? Over here. The thief on the cross could never have been baptized with the baptism Jesus commanded. Because by the time Jesus commanded it, the thief on the cross was dead. And you, you and I can't prove whether he was or wasn't baptized. And you know this, the thief said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. I draw about just a little bit farther here. The thief on a cross may very well have been baptized. But, because there was another baptism at that time. John's baptism. Whose baptism is over here in our time? Jesus' baptism. Not only, see over here, John's baptism offered forgiveness. Over here, Jesus' baptism, forgiveness, Holy Spirit. Well, I can't believe that he was baptized considering he was a thief. <laughs> Come on now. Don't want to start mentioning names. I remember Ananias and Sapphira, they were baptized believers in the church in Acts 5. And they were thieves. And I can try to, I can mention some, I don't know about here, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank, aren't you glad? <laughs> but I can go to the previous churches and say, oh God, that's the church teach. Hey, the point is this, Jesus, while he was on earth, had the authority to forgive whomever he wished. The Bible teaches that. The place where he had the withered hand, the guy had the withered hand, and all of a sudden Jesus healed his hand on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. So Jesus had the perfect right to say to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And I'm telling you folks, be careful. You don't base your salvation on that because Jesus was speaking to the thief under the old law. And now God's word, Jesus' word is speaking to you and we're under the new law. Okay? Precision. And we look at this picture here say, oh, man. Then we want to be precise about biblical matters. We say, we're a little lazy. No, we're not. We're a lot lazy. I was talking with Ron this morning, and something somewhere came up. The thought that came to mind said, you know, you think about when spiritual revival swept through our land, America. It wasn't the 1900s, was it? It was the 1800s. 1820s, 1830s, before they might know what we didn't have back in those days. Radio, and that caused some distractions from reading that book. Television, anything 
an iPhone, an iPad, and all this other stuff. Microphones that keep rubbing against your jacket and you drive nuts. And so I think what has happened in our society today, see, back then they didn't have those distractions. And they knew that if they were going to learn God's word, they had to study it for themselves. Like those in Berea in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul spoke the word of God to them. Read that verse down. And be like them. The Bible says that when the Bereans heard the Apostle Paul preach, they went on television. They were in person. And as he spoke, the Bible says that they received the word of God with great eagerness. See these people win the lottery. I'm not into the lottery thing, okay? Besides, if I played one, who am I going to tell? <laughs> but you see it winning in their life. It was going to be. Acts 17, verse 11. The Bereans received the word of God with all eagerness. Man. Then the Bible says that they examined the scriptures. Every day to see whether those things spoken by Paul were really so. <laughs> so I hope that's what you'll do. And that we will all go through that. We will, and anytime we get a chance to study God's word and to hear God's word, we're going to be there, right? We're going to be there. And we're going to receive it with all hands. Just like our little puppy dog, man, going to be rich. <clears throat> Or when we're sitting down to eat, it's like she's always there. <laughs> and she loves cheese. She loves chicken. She loves watermelon. You should have seen them my pants. <laughs> Is there anything in it? She, huh? <clears throat> Vegetables. <laughs> Loves people. If you see her tonight, I don't know where we're going to have her, but she's going to want to meet you. <laughs> eager. There's a squirrel out there. She's eager for the mission. Each one reaps one, man. The squirrels don't want to save. Anytime the table is spread, she's there. Fellowship. Praise her bread. In fact, she's there even while we're praying. <laughs> See, see. Let me close with this. I think you get the point. I'm just trying to drive it home. I probably should have entitled this sermon "Decisions," but call it specifics. Pay attention to the specifics. I sent a text to myself to see if I can recall what it was. I, I texted it to myself last night, so I won't forget this. I used to work in a steel mill in Mississippi, and uh, structural steel. Worked midnight shift, and. Uh, I think his name was Steve Albert Caldwell. We put together this piping handrail for the oil rigs out in the ocean. First thing Steve said, can you read a rule? So yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Gave me a measurement, I cut it an inch short. <laughs> oh man, he had some choice for you. How I'd say the leadership meeting, you know what I mean? Woo! I'm going to say you can read a rule! <laughs> Well, it, it was like, I forget how many inches, it was seven eighths, you know, and I was paying, I was saying, paying so close attention to the seven eighths, I was just on the wrong side of the room, in the end, and then short. And then I was real careful to be precise, but you see, these have to be precise. Pay attention to the specifics. And uh, I think they call those blueprints, another word for it is, is it specs? It's specs. But see, the way it worked was, we would make a portion of the oil rig, and then some other steel company in some other state, somewhere hundreds of, who knows how many thousand miles away in America, they're making other parts for the oil rig. And you might have this angle iron, remember that machine, you to type all the exact information into the nearest thousand to punch the holes in the whole nine yards. And then it would be shipped off to a place where they would assemble that, and those engineers out there in the ocean were counting on us to make sure we paid attention to the specifics so that they could take our parts that were assembled and that other company's parts and who knows maybe somewhere on the other side of the planet another country that sent their parts and they could all put that thing together it would fit perfectly and the holes would align perfectly 
because we were all using the same blueprint. We were all using the same Come up together with you. This book will never lead you wrong. When we end up going wrong, it's some faulty part of our study. But well, we haven't paid attention, but it's all here. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 16. I was telling you an illustration about making these parts and exact measurements. It was just mind boggling to me, but I tell you what, it's really amazing once they got the bigger picture to realize that okay, this is a little tank, piece of bang wire. It's only a foot and a half long, and the whole, it's got two holes right here, but these two holes are going onto a larger beam, and then some platform that the guys want to be walking across, you know, their life depends on us following these instructions. And, and they're going to take all these different parts that we made in the same blueprint, and they're going to fit it together. And they're hoping for it to be perfect. And so in Ephesians 4.16, here's the spiritual analogy of that. From whom? Okay, that's a tough word to start. With. From whom? You gotta go back to the previous word, Christ. It's from Christ that the whole body is being fit and held together by whatever joint supplies. For the proper work of you know, each individual part and it causes the growth of the body to the building up of itself. But we'll pay attention to the specifics. We'll be as precise as possible. We'll be as precise as the word of God is. Just like that oil rig today, that work we did back in the 1980s, somewhere there's an oil rig out there that has my handiwork in it. And someone else's handiwork. But it wasn't because of my knowledge or brilliance, it was because of the blueprint that somebody and so it's not because of our knowledge or our brilliance, but it's because of Christ and because of his blueprint, God's word, that 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, into eternity, our work will be more. And it's lives being changed, it's lives being saved, because Christians in this city and Christians in that city were willing to follow the same blueprint. And as a result, the whole body, the whole church is being fit together as each place that everybody plays an individual part. And it's all the God's work. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song, one of my favorites, a long time ago. It's called The Banner of the Cross. And as I said, we, we are under attack spiritually. It's becoming more and more evident that the Christians are the parties. You and I have weapons available to us. We talked about this last week. And they're divinely powerful. Prayer. And the one from which I've been trying to quote the whole one of God's word. The first to it is soul and spirit. Now it's through the word of God that souls can be saved. How many of you also know that the word of God is not used properly to destroy people? So let's be careful as we go forward this week with God's word. That we pay attention to the specifics of God's word. This double-edged sword, and that we be precise as God is, and that we seek as we, as the Word of God divides even to the, the very most parts of a person's soul, that we deliver it, ourselves to deliver it. The banner of the cross, if you're going to wave that banner, you better be specific, you better be precise, do it for God's glory. Let's see this. There's a royal banner on this place, it's all very well and deep. As we stand ready, we love the name for this and for that 